Good afternoon. Welcome to our midweek Bible moment here at the Fulton Church of Christ. We appreciate you joining us here and tuning in this afternoon as we have a short devotional thought. Uh, before we get into our devotional thought, before um, I was trying to think of some announcements to make, uh, as of right now, we really don't have a whole lot of uh, announcements other than ones we made Sunday morning. Uh, remember those families that have lost loved ones. Uh, we're thankful for those we've heard who have gotten over this virus and healed from that. Uh, we're thankful for the, the word there and pray that you continually remember that. Uh, the people who are suffering with that as well as some others. Um, Remember those that have not been well. Well, like I say, right, as of right now, we don't have any specific sick, so we're glad about that. Uh, one quick announcement for our church people. Remember that there is a table set up in our auditorium, our lobby, excuse me, of our building uh, for Nathan Chandler. Chandler. Uh, this is for his graduation. Uh, remember, he graduated this year. Uh, his graduation will be later in this month, but we've set up a table for him. Uh, so if you have cards or gifts you'd like to bring to him, bring it and leave it there, uh, and I'm sure he would appreciate that. Um, Tonight, I want to talk about something I was thinking about uh, with our uh, article today. I was thinking about what, what's been on my mind, and I think it's on a lot of people's mind, uh, and that is looking at this civil unrest we are dealing with uh, and, and asking the question, how do we respond to it? Uh, in the article, I sort of talk some ideas about that, but I, there's another side of this I want to talk about that I want to spend time with our, our devotional with, uh, and that is to think about what we're called to do. Because when we look at the idea uh, of, of racism, we look at the idea of racial prejudice, uh, we'll see that is something that's been in our world since the beginning. Now, that doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean it's honorable. That doesn't mean any of that. It just means it's a problem that mankind has always dealt with. And as a matter of fact, whenever I think about racism in the Bible, there's one story that always comes to my mind uh, that really sets up the idea of how God and Jesus wants us to react to racism. Uh, and that story comes from Luke 10, and it's one of my favorite parables to preach about. Uh, because, one, it's a parable we know, but also it's a parable that we, we know, but we don't know all the background to it. And that parable comes from Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse uh, 25. Uh, it begins to tell us about what we call the Good Samaritan. Now, beginning in verse 25, uh, we, we read the account this way. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and, all, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to the place where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you, more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think protect, uh, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. You see, uh, we could spend a whole lot of time here, but I, I want to sort of boil this down to the necessity of this. What you see is a, a, a lawyer, a man who understood God's law, who, who studied the old law, who was a man that you went to with all your Bible questions, is asking Jesus, trying to find a fault in Jesus and asking him, what I got to do in Terry turn life? Not a bad question, a question we read throughout the Bible. And Jesus asked him, now notice what Jesus asked him. He says, what does the law say and how do you read it? You see, Jesus one wants to understand how this lawyer understands the law, and the lawyer gives that the answer Jesus gave. Here's the law. Love the Lord God with your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and then love your neighbor as yourself. He says, that's the law. And Jesus says, yes, that's right. But then notice verse 28. He says, you answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, we missed something here. When this lawyer says, this is what the law calls me to do, and Jesus says, do this, Jesus is calling this lawyer out because this lawyer has been someone who claimed to know the law, who claimed to be a faithful follower of God, who claimed to be obedient, 
but wasn't actually doing it. How do I know that one? Well, notice next verse. It says, and, but he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself. Well, he needed to justify himself because Jesus just called him out. Jesus just called him on the carpet, as we may say. And Jesus just showed that this lawyer, although he knew the law, wasn't doing it. And then the lawyer said, well, who's my neighbor? Well, that's a loaded question. Because, you see, in Jewish times, there were two different answers to this question, depending on who you talk to. And the people were heavily divided about this answer. One group said that the neighbor, or the neighbor, is, my, is a fellow Jew. Only Jews were considered to be the neighbors. And the other answer was that all men were the neighbors. And you want to talk about getting a crowd riled up, it was you ask this question, you teach about who is my neighbor. And depending on what you say, it depends on how the crowd reacted. And notice what Jesus says here. The man asks, he says, well, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus begins to not give him an answer, but give him a story. And he tells a story about three men. One man's on the road. He gets attacked in a bad part of town, a bad trail, and a trail notoriously for getting robbed, for notoriously getting attacked. Uh, a trail you didn't go to unless you just had to. It was the quickest way, but it was a dangerous way. He gets attacked. He's left on the side road for dead. First comes the Jewish priest, the man who was the, the representative between uh, the, the, the representative of God on earth, the representative who would go to the temple and offer sacrifices, do what was required to offer to, to, to reconcile man with God. He sees this guy on the side of the road. What does he do? It says he sees him. He doesn't just miss him. He sees him and willfully gets to the other side of the road and tries to get around him as quickly as possible. The second man, a Levite, a man who was in charge of taking care of the temple. Another man who was a representative of God who ought to have done something. He sees this man. Again, the idea of a certain man is a certain Jew. A certain Jew is here. He sees him, and he too walks around him. And then he gets to the third man, the Samaritan. Now, this is where we sometimes lose part of the story. Because to us, a Samaritan, when I tell, I already mentioned to you a Samaritan, you automatically think of this story, a good Samaritan. Samaritan's a good word, a good thing to describe somebody by. But we're going to see in Bible times, that's not quite true. Not that they were bad people, but they were a different people. You see, a Samaritan in Jewish history was a mixed race. During the kings of Assyria, when they come down into Israel, the northern kingdom, and took it into captivity, they left some Jews behind. But what the Assyrians would do is they would capture people, they would take them from take some from their homeland, and they would put them in all different parts of their kingdom. They did this so that the people couldn't unite and fight against them. So what happens is they take some of the Jews and they disperse them out to other parts of their kingdom. They bring Gentiles in and settle them in Samaria. They settle them in this area of Israel. And so what happens is, as time progresses, these Jews who are in Samaria, they are surrounded by these Gentiles, they lose their identity. They begin to intermarry. And they begin to create a third race. You know, typically in the New Testament, you see Jews and Gentiles. Well, the third race you see are the Samaritans. This is a half-breed, they would call them. Uh, they're half-Jew, half-Gentile. And to the Jews, a Samaritan was worse than a Gentile in most cases. The Samaritans, they would call him a dog. And again, to call someone a dog is not a compliment. And so what you see in this story, and this is how bad this is, the Jews and Samaritans, if you notice when, when Jesus in the Bible talks about traveling to Jerusalem, the, some of the other Jews you read about this, the Jews would go out of their way to avoid Samaria because they thought to even go to the land where the Samaritans lived would cause them to sin and they couldn't worship God. That's prejudice. That's racial. All right, that's racism. And so this man who is viewed as being a dog by most of the people, he stops. He sees a man on the side of the road, and the idea is not that he sees a man on the side of the road, it's that he stops. He has compassion. He has sympathy for this man. He binds him up. He, he treats him as best he can. Then he takes him to the inn and, and treats him for the rest of the night. Then he pays for the man to be treated and, and to take care of from there. And, and this is the idea. This is a story that the least expected man, as a matter of fact, to the Jews who probably heard this story the first time, when Jesus said a Samaritan come through, they thought, okay, here's the Samaritan and he's going to finish this Jew off. He's going to go ahead and kill this Jew and he's just going to be dead on the side of the road and, and I don't know what the point of this story is going to be. Because that was how they viewed Samaritans. And Jesus flips their world upside down when he says that the Samaritan is the one who stops and helps him. 
Now, what's the point of this? Well, notice the last question. Jesus asked the lawyer again. And he's asked the lawyer in verse uh, 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Which one was a neighbor? Which one was a neighbor? And the lawyer gives the long answer. You ever notice this? This again shows the lawyer's prejudice. This again shows the lawyer's mindset. If we were to go into any kind of our Bible classes and teach this story, the number one answer they're going to tell us is the Samaritan. Why? That's easy. One word answer, the Samaritan. Or maybe they said the good Samaritan. But what does the lawyer say? The lawyer says the one who showed him mercy. Why? Because the lawyer was so prejudiced against the Samaritan, who he viewed as a dog, as he viewed as a low-life, underprivileged citizen, he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said the one who showed him mercy. And then notice what Jesus says lastly. And this is the point of this whole parable. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Remember what made the lawyer upset back in verse uh, 28? But Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this, do this, twice in this account, twice in this encounter. Jesus has said, do this. Do you know why the Good Samaritan is good? It's not because he stopped and helped the man necessarily. It's not because he was being a good citizen, as we sometimes use that word today. It's that he was doing God's word. He was doing God's will. He was living the right life. At this moment in our world, when we have such unrest, we have such hardship, such hard feelings, such torn up, how do we react to it? What do we say? Because you see, in your life, in your social media, in your day-to-day -day life, you're going to come across people. You're going to find people who are on the side of the road who are hurting. People who have been knocked down by life. The question is, what are you going to do about it? We know what the Bible says. The Bible says, Love the Lord your God with like your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes, we, we can do we do that. But it also says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was saying, John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give you. Not only that you love your neighbor as yourself, but that you love each other as I have loved you. Jesus said, Be willing to die for each other. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. The world, all the world. At this time of unrest, at this time of riot, at this time of hardship, who do we love? Who's our neighbor? Do we view our neighbors the only ones who look like us, who talk like us, who act like us? Or do we realize that every human being in this world is our neighbor? And it is our God-given responsibility to love them, to care for them, and treat them as we'd want to be treated. Brothers and sisters, let us strive to be God people who love our neighbors as ourselves, who love our neighbors, no matter what differences we may have, no matter what may be separating us, let us use the love of Christ to grow closer together. Tonight, if you're not showing that love of God, we encourage you to change your life so that you are. Maybe you've not found that love of God. That love of God that doesn't see us as white, black, yellow, whatever. We, we, we see God as that song we sing. When we sing, Jesus loves little children. Red and yellow, black and white. He loves them all. Why? Because to God, they're souls. They're souls that need a Savior. Do you need that Savior? Do you need to make your life right? If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one. Ask for His forgiveness and He'll wash you clean. If you'd like to study more about that, contact us, write us, email us, text us, call us, do whatever it takes. Let us know what we can do for you. Or maybe you're a Christian who's fallen away, who stopped loving your neighbor, who stopped being the kind of person God's called you to be. Change your life. Repent of that. Come back to him, and he'll make you right before it's too late. If you would, tonight, I want you to bow with me as we have a closing word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, our Father, creator of all beings, creator of all things, sustainer of all things, lover of all things, we pray, Father, at this moment that you be with our world. We know our world, our nation, is in a time of 
unrest, a time of chaos, Father. We know that love, that chaos comes because of unlove, because of prejudice, Father. We just pray that you would help us as individuals. Help us, Father, do our part. Do our part, Father, to love each other. To love each other no matter what happens. To love each other no matter what we're different about. To realize, Father, that as you have loved us, we ought to love each other. Help us, Father, to have our hearts softened. To have those hearts that can be touched by your word. That will be obedient to you. We pray, Father, that you would help us to demonstrate that true idea to love our neighbor. And we pray, Father, the world will see that. And that this world of chaos, Father, can calm down again. That changes will be made and things done, Father, that will help to bring peace and love to all people. We we'll pray again, above all, Father, that you'd help us to be your people. To love this world as you've called us to. To love the people, Father, and to love you. We pray now, Father, that you help us and we'll love those that are sick. Care for them, Father. Pray for them as only we can. We know, Father, again, on top of this unrest, we're dealing with this virus. We pray that you be at those who have been sick, who have been having problems because of this, Father. We pray that they'll be healed. We pray that they'll find the, the, the care they need, Father, that everything will continue to improve and everything will continue to do good. We pray, Father, that you be at those others who've had surgeries, who've had uh, other illnesses, Father. Be with them. Comfort them and strengthen them, Father, as only you can do. We again, Father, pray that you look after us in all of our obedience to you. Pray, Father, that you'd help us. May we live lives that are right, that are holy and acceptable for you. Then we pray, Father, that you be with those families who've lost loved ones, those who are having difficult times, Father, those who are struggling. And may they find the hope, the care, the assurance, Father, that comes from you and you alone. We again, Father, pray that you look after us, care for us, and be with us, Father, and help us again to live lives that are right with you, that are holy before you, Father lives in which we love all the brethren. Father, again, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for being the God who loves us all and cares for us. And we pray, Father, that you forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our shortcomings, and help us, Father, to live and life, live and act and love in such a way that one day, Father, we can be able to have that great, glorious, and wonderful home with you in heaven. And Father, sing and bless us in the name we do pray. Amen. Again, appreciate you joining us this evening. We hope that you're having a God-blessed week, and we hope to see you all come Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Thank you.